Welcome to those who are joining. Um, it's great to see lots of people dialing in. We're going to wait a couple more minutes uh, until we have some more people, um, and then we're going to get started with our webinar. I'll just give it an, an, uh, another minute or so. Okay, in the interest of time, we'll get started. We've got a lot of great, great content to share with you today. I'm sure more people will join as we go. Um, my name is Victoria. I'm director of the Globescan office in Hong Kong, um, and we're very, very happy to be partnering with WWF and UNEP to deliver you this piece of research and webinar today. So I hope you find it very interesting. Um, of course, as you know, the, the focus is communicating food sustainability to consumers. We've got um, some very engaging speakers, some experts on the topic, so we do hope that you enjoy as we go. So I'll give you a quick um, overview of what we're gonna cover in terms of the agenda. Um, so we're going to have a introduction and background of the project. Um, we're going, then gonna present a summary of findings, move to a panel discussion. Like I said, we've got experts from different organizations in different places um, who are gonna give us their insights. There's then going to be a opportunity to ask your own question and answers, um, and then we will uh, wrap up. Hopefully you will have all learned something, found something interesting, and uh, that will be it. So in terms of the objectives for today's webinar, we want to discuss the study findings, um, and uh, importantly, the recommendations and how best to apply them, of course, so that you can have something actionable to take away from this webinar. We also want to help identify the main challenges and possible solutions. So with that in mind, I'm going to hand over to Denise Westerhout from WWF. She's going to give a project background um, and a lot more context as to the content of the study. Thank you, Victoria. Um, as she's mentioned, I'm Denise. I work with WWF on the behavior change component of <clears throat> the network. Um, so we know that consumer behavior around the world is changing, part, partly as a result of the, of the current global pandemic, political crisis, and climate change issues. So with consumer behaviors in flux, it is important to understand which are the main drivers who can and who can help inform and guide consumer choice. So under the UN Environment Program, the One Planet Network was formed to implement the commitment of the 10 YFP. <clears throat> The One Planet Network's consumer information program serves as a, a global platform to support the provision of quality information on goods and services and the identification and implementation of effective strategies. Um, this program encourages actors across the food value chain, in particular retail and food companies on sustainable information. WWF, on the other hand, has actively been working on integrating behavioral science in our conservation and sustainability project. Back in 2020, we launched a behavioral science publication titled Save Nature Please Framework and Report that sought to pro provide a, an easily adaptable start to applying behavior change interventions. Um, in addition to our growing expertise around this topic, WWF has a deep knowledge of behavior evolution and insights of voluntary sustainability standards and eco-labeling initiatives. And uh, last but not least, GlobeScan is a global insights and advisory consultancy. Equipped with expertise in areas of sustainability, communications, and certifications, uh, consumer behavior and global trends, as well as the knowledge of food and beverage sector, GlobeScan supported the study and development of 12 business and labor case studies. Some of the some of the highlights and observations have been included in the white paper, which will be presented to you shortly. The purpose of this project is to deepen our understanding of how the provision of sustainability information can influence consumer food choices. This collaboration includes 12 case studies um, of selected companies, some of which you will hear from, and food sustainability labels together additional insights on how consumers uh, 
integrate information um, and understand how they make their decisions. The white paper, which we're here for today, investigates drivers of consumer choices, sources of consumer information, different responses, um, gaps between observed behaviors and stated preferences when it comes to food sustainability. Now, without getting into too much, um, I want to pass the screen over to my colleague and the lead writer of the white paper, Joshua Bishop, out of the Breath of Australia, to present his um, summary of the report and key findings. Josh, over to you. Thank you and uh, greetings, everybody. Uh, it's Josh Bishop here. I'm a conservation economist based in Sydney, Australia with WWF uh, Australia. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land from which uh, I am speaking. Uh, that's the uh, Gadigal people of the Eora Nation um, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And also to acknowledge their sustainable food ways um, developed over millennia, uh, almost lost to history um, and now fortunately being recovered. Um, I'm going to present uh, the white paper today and I'd like to start by thanking and acknowledging uh, colleagues at UN Environment Program, uh, my uh, peers uh, and friends at uh, WWF and Globescan, uh, research assistants in particular Jack Thomas and Sharmi Ahmed, uh, as well as academic advisors, technical reviewers, and many other contributors to this project. Next slide. Um, so my presentation today is quite brief, um, but it is going to try to cover uh, the, the report uh, from top to bottom. Um, and the presentation follows the outline of the report with a brief introduction, uh, a uh, excursion into what we know about the drivers of consumer food choices generally, uh, then focus on the role of information and sustainability information in particular in consumer food choice, and wrap up with some general conclusions and recommendations. Next slide. So as I said, uh, first we're going to do a little bit of introduction. Next slide. Um, you've already heard the uh, objectives of the project as a whole. Um, the objectives of the, the literature review or the white paper, as we uh, call it, are a little bit more uh, focused. As I said, we want to look at the drivers of food choice, what sources of information consumers rely on when they choose food, how they respond to sustainability information, and uh, particularly to uh, food labels. Um, what are the challenges and opportunities of food labeling and food sustainability information campaigns? How can we strengthen consumers' response to that information? Um, I should point out that uh, this presentation and the report that it's based on focuses on the effectiveness of food sustainability information for influencing consumer choices. Um, we do not attempt to assess the truthfulness of food sustainability claims which would require uh, analysis of actual production practices, uh, food processing and distribution. And um, that's beyond the scope of this report, which as I said, focuses on the, the consumer or demand side of the, the food, uh, food systems. Um, I should note, however, that there is quite a lot of guidance on how to assess the credibility of food, uh, sustainability information and claims. And we provide uh, quite a number of uh, relevant resources throughout the report. Next slide. So I think to begin with, it's, it's worth acknowledging something about the food systems that we have in the world today. And um, I've, I've used the word extraordinary. Uh, and I, I use that um, without qualification. I think the fact that uh, food systems globally deliver reliable access to diverse foods for billions of people at relatively modest cost um, is a testament to the, um, the, the power of um, our uh, modern world, as well as to traditional food ways in keeping us uh, fed and uh, with, with nutritious uh, foods from all around the world. At the same time, we know that there are um, some problems in the, the world food systems, um, in including 
many of the issues, environmental impacts listed here, greenhouse gas emissions, forest and biodiversity loss, use of fresh water, um, impacts not just on land, but also in the marine environment, due, largely due to fishing and aquaculture. Um, we know that food waste uh, is uh, rampant all around the world, although concentrated especially in high income households, and that food waste essentially exacerbates the environmental impact of food because it means we're producing far more food than, than we actually need. Uh, we also know that most food waste ends up in landfill um, where it rots, um, and we have yet another contribution to greenhouse gas emissions and, uh, and climate change. Uh, in short, I think it's fair to say that the, the full costs and benefits of food systems, when you take a, a comprehensive look, are not shared equitably um, between present and future generations. Um, uh, looking specifically at the, uh, the immediate needs, we know that mal malnutrition persists. One in nine people go hungry every day. One in three people are overweight or obese um, uh, due to uh, food consumption. And we also are increasingly seeing evidence that without dietary change, it may be impossible to feed everyone and still stay within uh, what are known as planetary boundaries. Uh, in short, um, sustainable food consumption is a key part of delivering the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. We cannot meet those goals without changes in food consumption. Next slide. We need to clarify or, or, or get uh, agreement on what, uh, what our definitions, what do we mean by sustainable food? What do we mean by uh, drivers and, and other things? Um, for this report, we, we define sustainable consumption based on what we have uh, read in the literature. And we sum that up by saying that on average, people choose or they are offered food products that use fewer natural resources and have less adverse impact or even ideally have a net positive impact on the environment. But there's also a social dimension. So food products need to be produced, processed and distributed in ways that meet or exceed global minimum social standards. And it's important that we include both the social and the environmental dimension in any discussion of food sustainability. In the report, we also look at a number of other key terms, consumers, communication, information, animal sourced foods, eco labels. Um, I, I won't uh, take the time now to go through all of those definitions, but uh, you can read the report for more detail. Next slide. So, one of the things that we know when we start looking at drivers of uh, sustainable food is that uh, food systems are incredibly complex. There are many different components to them. You can see across the top some of the, the main drivers. This report and uh, this presentation focuses on that box in the middle with the red circle around it, the consumer behaviors. Um, and we're interested in understanding how to influence those consumer behaviors um, so that we can shift uh, consumers towards more sustainable foods. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, uh, we begin by looking at what are the major drivers of consumer food choices, because that's the context within which sustainability information um, has to, to get traction. Next slide, please. Um, and the literature makes it quite clear that there are uh, a huge number of different uh, drivers of uh, consumer food choice, ranging from external, contextual, uh, structural, or supply, supply side factors through to uh, intrinsic or inherent features of food itself and biological um, features of, uh, of human beings, right? The, our, our, our appetites, our tastes, our preferences. Um, there are also social factors and uh, including culture and tradition and habit and fashion and of course prices and many other factors as well. And any 
attempt to influence food sustainability choices or food choices generally um, needs to take account of all of these different uh, drivers of, um, of food consumption. Next slide. One of the things that we observe in the literature is that uh, some of these broader drivers, some of these structural or, or contextual drivers are, um, are helping. They're, they're pushing consumers towards more sustainable food choices, whereas other drivers are pushing in the wrong direction, away from sustainability. Uh, this is um, one of the more comprehensive studies that I've come across um, by Bene et al. Um, and they looked at uh, statistical correlations between different drivers of food systems change and different indicators of sustainability across almost 100 countries. And they found that, uh, unfortunately, most of the drivers they looked at um, that uh, had uh, statistically significant correlations with food system sustainability were uh, pushing in the wrong direction. Some positive correlations, goods and services trade, foreign direct investment, uh, and cereal yield. So that might be surprising to some of you that globalization, certain aspects of globalization are pushing uh, towards more sustainable food systems. But uh, on the other hand, there are a number of negative correlations, growth in per capita GDP, agricultural expansion for obvious reasons, um, uses more land and water, increased fertilizer use, uh, and, and even more so urbanization, population growth, and what the uh, authors call lifestyle change, which they measure as a change in female employment and services, which uh, is interesting. And we could dive deeper into that particular indicator, but I think we'll, we'll move on. You can read about it in the report. Next slide, please. So one of the things that we also observe in the literature is that food sustainability is uh, is a factor in consumers' food choices, but uh, it's usually not their top priority when choosing food products. So this data here is from the United States, um, but I don't think it's atypical of, of other regions. And it shows that uh, over time, uh, taste is identified routinely as, uh, by most consumers as the most important factor, followed by price, healthfulness, convenience, um, and sustainability is there. It's significant, but it comes much lower. Uh, the dotted line between 2018 and 2019 represents a change in the, uh, the way the question was posed, um, but essentially it's the, the, the same trend that we observe. Next slide. We also see that um, consumer food preferences are, are not static, not, notwithstanding the, the evidence of the previous slide. There are um, discernible uh, trends in, in consumer food preferences. Um, we see the rise of organic foods over the past century, roughly. Um, we see a more recently growing interest in plant-rich diets. Uh, we also see the rise of online food shopping and food delivery services. Um, and we know that these preferences, while they are uh, evolving, they're also subject to disruption. So recently, we've all lived through the, the COVID-19 pandemic, and indeed, we are arguably still living through it. Um, and we've seen uh, how that has affected, for example, the, the preference for online food shopping and food delivery. Um, and most recently, sadly, we've seen the impacts of the war in Ukraine on uh, the supply of fertilizer and wheat and uh, vegetable oil and, and many other commodities um, uh, and the dramatic impact that that's having on food prices. Next slide. So the, the bulk of this uh, report uh, focuses on sustainability information and consumer food choices. Next slide. And I, I think uh, the, the starting point here is to acknowledge that people uh, rely on many different sources of information about food in making their choices. Uh, consumers can find it difficult to assess certain food attributes, uh, in particular claims they can't verify directly. Um, they may perceive sellers' claims as a kind of evidence, but not always reliable. Um, they do value information about uh, product attributes, but at the same time, consumers 
are often unwilling to invest very much time or effort to, uh, to process that information. And labels are therefore one of the, uh, the sort of shorthand or quick ways that uh, consumers can get information to guide their food choices. Next slide. I'm conscious that I'm running out of time, so I'm going to move along at a slightly faster clip. Um, we know that uh, trust is a, a key factor in whether consumers um, act on uh, sustainability information, whether from labels or other sources. And most of the evidence here comes from Europe and, and North America. Um, there is a, a real gap in data from the global south. But we see that uh, European consumers, for example, express most trust in uh, ec independent experts, consumer organizations, and they have less trust in politicians, uh, industry, and uh, retailers. Um, consumers are receptive to small-scale producer voices, but they don't hear much from those producers. Um, and uh, we also learn that if you combine information from multiple sources, that can help build trust. Um, and that ultimately the effectiveness of uh, food labels depends on whether consumers are uh, uh, familiar with the label, whether they understand what it means, um, as well as their trust in its credibility. And those, those factors are interrelated. Um, plus there's a, a few um, statistics on the right-hand side from a study in the US on uh, who do people trust, who do consumers trust. Least trusted sources, interestingly, were friends and family, media and food companies. Food for thought, pun intended. Next slide. Getting to the, um, the nub of uh, uh, this research, do food labels work? Are they effective? And I think the, the answer from the literature is yes. They have a measurable uh, and statistically positive influence on consumer choice of sustainable foods. Uh, labels and other kinds of sustainability guidelines do increase consumers accuracy in selecting uh, environmentally friendly foods. Um, successful labeling is correlated with knowledge and awareness of a label and its visibility um, and its design. So well-designed labels are meaningful to consumers and are quick and easy to understand. Um, and interestingly, consumers pretty consistently say that they're willing to pay more for uh, labeled products than for conventional foods. It's not a huge margin, um, but uh, it can make a difference in a, a highly competitive retail market. Next slide. There are a number of challenges with uh, eco-labeling. Uh, in the first place, what consumers say uh, or tell you in a survey doesn't always align with their actual behavior. Um, so there's what we call an intention action gap. Um, we know that labels are more effective with some consumer segments than with others. Female and younger shoppers in particular seem to be more receptive. Likewise, those uh, with higher incomes or more education, and especially consumers with what are called uh, aligned values and beliefs, or they're already receptive to sustainability messages, they are, are more likely to um, rely on labels to make choices. At the same time, labels can be ignored or misinterpreted. Um, people may perceive products as better on many more criteria than the label actually uh, conveys. Uh, people may make assumptions about the ingredients of, of packaged food just based on the, um, the, the materials that the, the product comes in. Um, and consumers may attribute health benefits to food products uh, that are labeled even when the label itself uh, says nothing about health impacts. So similar re uh, lessons from experience with health and nutritional labels. Um, which you can read about in the report. Next slide. Um, one of the other things that we learn from the literature is that sustainability information is more influential when it comes as part of an integrated consumer communication campaign. This is an example from uh, Nor Meal Kits. It's a, a brand of, owned by Unilever. We have a case study on Unilever if you're interested. Um, and it combined uh, not just the information about sustainability, but uh, nudges and other uh, and um, and uh, training and support and and uh, promotions, a range of different techniques to uh, encourage consumers to make use of these products. 
but also to use them with plants rather than meat. So the focus of, of this particular campaign was on encouraging uh, plant-rich diets. Next slide. I think we can summarize some of the, the lessons from um, the, the recent research is that we need to take account of consumer psychology. It's not just, it's not enough to just convey the information, um, that information is more influential when combined with motivational goals when it, or when it emphasizes social norms. Um, some of the, the empirical research shows that by building community, um, enlisting advice from experts, uh, providing free product samples, um, you can make a, a more uh, significant and sustained difference in uh, consumer behavior. Um, and in particular, that nudges or what we call um, uh, interventions, interventions that uh, influence the, the choice architecture, the way food is presented, um, the, the, the first opportunity, uh, a uh, product that is presented to you, for example, um, can be some of the most influential ways to, to influence food choice. So it's not just about the information, it's about the context within which food is presented to the consumer, um, whether it comes at the top of the menu or further down uh, in, in bold font or normal font. Think subtle differences in, in presentation can make a huge difference. Next slide. I'm going to wrap up now. I've gone uh, over time, I realize. So conclusions and recommendations. Uh, just to recap some of the major conclusions. Next slide. So we know that consumer information is necessary, but insufficient to achieve uh, sustainable food systems. Uh, sustainability is just one of many drivers of uh, consumer food choices. Uh, consumer preferences are evolving um, and often correlated. Uh, in general, it's easier to work with the grain of choice drivers rather than against them. So, for example, we can use digital technology, a, re a relatively recent innovation, to verify claims and to confirm food provenance, which makes it easier for consumers to choose sustainable products. Or thinking about globalization of food supply chains, on the one hand, they can reduce consumers influence on direct influence on producers, but at the same time that can uh, globalization can help spread sustainability messages and methods. We know that consumers respond uh, positively to eco labels and sustainability information. Um, we also know that uh, and have learned that how we communicate and to whom is just as important as what we say and that using behavioral methods and incentives can increase uptake. Last slide. And thank you for your patience. Next slide, please. So some key recommendations. Um, first of all, uh, I think you've probably got the message. Um, it's uh, information is part of a broader uh, context. So sustainability communications must be informed by food choice drivers. Uh, consumer education must be based on sound science. There's a lot of myth out there uh, around labels. Um, messages and interventions are need to be adapted to the, the target audience. We need uh, much more research and innovation on the use of incentives, uh, behavioral nudges, and other non-coercive measures to encourage plant-rich and whole food choices. Labels uh, need to be part of an integrated package of communication methods. Uh, any consumer information has to be visible and accessible, easy to understand, reliable, credible, uh, holistic, and comparable. Um, and I think uh, this, the next point, people who already use sustainability information. So those consumers who are responsive to food labels and other information about sustainability, we can learn from them. What is it that uh, they know or they feel or they believe that we can use to reach out to groups um, and who are not currently influenced? How do we strengthen and, and widen the social norms around food sustainability? Food businesses can and should collaborate uh, more to identify effective messages and media for encouraging sustainable food choices. At the moment, it's, it's commercially in confidence. Um, there's an opportunity maybe to collaborate more to do this uh, in a pre-competitive way. Governments obviously have an important role in uh, encouraging and, and uh, regulating food certifications and rating schemes. 
but they can also encourage businesses to use some of these more innovative behavioral techniques to communicate sustainability and to make sustainable food choices the, the default option. Um, lastly, sustainability criteria need to be integrated more consistently in national dietary guidelines. Some countries have started down that road, Brazil and Canada come to mind, but we could do much more uh, in that vein. Um, and uh, perhaps most importantly, we need to ensure that sustainable foods are not just a niche product that is accessible only to those who are willing and able to pay uh, uh, the uh, additional cost, but uh, we need government to sort support to ensure wide access to sustainable foods uh, in uh, both the global north and the global south. Next slide. And that is it. Thanks for your patience. Thanks for listening. And I look forward to the panel discussion and the Q&A session. Thank you very much, Josh. That was uh, fascinating. I think there's lots and lots of facets to uh, making sure that sustainable food consumption is something that we continue to drive uh, so that we can achieve those UN sustainability goals that you mentioned. Um, quite a few challenges along the way. It sounds like some of them uh, maybe government can answer, some of them uh, companies, food companies can answer. What we're going to do now is turn to our panelists who have experience and expertise across the board in everything from decision making to um, labeling itself. Um, so I'm going to introduce each one of our panelists. You should be able to see them all. Here they are on the on the screen. I'm going to start uh, at the bottom of this slide with uh, with Tom. Tom Peake, who's the marketing manager for Seafood at Simplot Australia, um, which is a global agri-food business. Um, he's responsible for the strategic direction, vision, growth and performance of Simplot's portfolio of seafood brands. Um, and they're working towards a more sustainable food future for its consumers. So really direct expertise there. Um, moving to the right, Yuk Young Hu, who is Director of Consumers Korea and a Council Member of Con Consumers International. Um, obviously, a lot of consumer experience as one of their most active consumer organisations in Korea. Um, consumers Korea is prioritising food safety, sustainable consumption and consumer movements for the digital world. So a lot of forward looking things there that we're going to be able to hear about. Uh, Dr. Adrian Kim Camilleri. I think I've pronounced that correctly, um, a consumer psychologist who works as a senior lecturer in marketing at the University of Technology, Sydney Business School. Um, he's got a bachelor's, a master's and PhD degree in psychology, so he really understands how we make decisions and what's going on when we decide which, which thing we're going to put in our basket. Um, he uh, uses experimental and survey research methods to understand and explain and predict cognitive processes underlying judgment and decision making. So that'll be very interesting to hear some of how that comes into play when making food choices. Uh, and last but certainly not least, Abhishek Jani, who is CEO of Fairtrade India. He leads a team responsible for building a sustainable and ethical platform for consumers, businesses and farmer organizations in India. Part of the Fair Trade International Network that I'm sure a lot of you are very familiar with, it enables smallholder farmers to commit to better social, economic and environmentally sustainable practices. Um, I'm sure he's got a lot to say on the matter of, of labelling and also the current situation of uh, where we're at with food systems. Um, so with that, I am going to hand to the panellists. I'm going to start with one big question, or we're going to hear from each of them, and that is, what big trends are you seeing in food consumption? And what are the implications of these shifts for how we communicate food sustainability? Um, and we'll start with Tom. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think this is something that Joshua kind of referred to earlier in, um, in, in some of his summary is something that I've been paying close attention to over the past few years is really around the role of brands and businesses in addressing sustainability issues and, and really how consumers see that role evolving. Um, there's been a huge amount of studies and articles on this topic. Um, and in all the studies from an Australian um, basis, it's been really clear that consumers see that businesses and brands should really be leading 
um, the way here and really see that business is having a greater role um, than other bodies such as, you know, retailers or governments, NGOs or even themselves. Um, and I think, you know, today's consumers have good intentions, but they really do look to, to brands to help to make those um, positive changes. Um, and I think it's really true when, you know, just to kind of bring it to life in an example, you know, we sell about 100 million cans of um, seafood a year. And when you try and influence every single one of those 100 million purchase decisions, you're really talking about, you know, a lot of, you know, individuals, a lot of, you know, different mindsets, a lot of different shopping trips. However, we can make a, a decision around, you know, for example, when we move to, um, you know, all of our skipjack tuna being MSC accredited, that's instantly 80 million cans, which are therefore a positive sustainability choice. So I, I think brands can and um, business can have a really strong role in solving these challenges. And I think there's definitely the expectation from consumers for um, brands and businesses to do just that. Fantastic. I agree. 100 million cans. That's that's a lot. <laughs> uh, so it's a lot. Uh... You can make a big difference, you know, with yeah absolutely there's definitely a, a role to be played um so sticking with the with the same question around uh shifts in consumption and 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 how we communicate food sustainability um maybe yuk young you can you can uh wade in from a, a consumer perspective sure um thank you so um as a consumer organization based in south korea i'd like to share with you some brief um insights from the korean consumer experience in food consumption. So um, during the pandemic, we have to start from the pandemic, we saw a huge shift in e-commerce in all the sectors. And um, naturally the way the people bought food has changed um, fundamentally. Um, one important um, takeaway that we found that uh, is that the consumers receive, it's obvious, um, but the consumers receive and access information differently when they're doing um, shopping online. Um, compared to offline um, settings. So in a recent survey that we conducted um, during the height of the pandemic, um, one third of the consumers experienced a lack of information or misinformation when, doing, when they were doing online shopping. And less than half of the consumers actually read the fine print, um, the labeling, for example, food nutrition information that uh, when they were like shopping online. So obviously the access to information is more challenging. Um, you have to um, click on more things. You have to scroll down for more information. The fonts might be smaller. The text images are blurrier. And it's so um, difficult for the consumers to um, access information. And another um, structural change that um, Joshua um, mentioned earlier is that, that we see a lifestyle change. So it's not just about like um, offline moving to online, but it's also food consumption is done um, at, at large e-commerce platforms and not just directly from a single producer or distributor. And also we see a surge um, in buying more prepared meals, restaurant food, pre-made pre meal kits and so forth. So whatever information strategies that were based on um, offline platforms or or based on traditional on um, food sales need to be updated to reflect these more complex um, distribution system that we have on online marketplaces, del food delivery apps and such. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think COVID-19 is uh, a catalyst for more online, um, but I, I person, my personal opinion, I haven't done research, is that um, I don't think that that's going away. So all extremely valid and will continue to be in the future. Perhaps Adrian, you can comment on um, our decision making, uh, we would more likely it sounds to look at labels when we've got a physical product in our hand than when we're browsing online or scrolling on our phones. Um, what do you think are some of the big trends in food consumption? Yeah, I guess a couple of different things come out of the uh, the pandemic. So yes, a lot more ordering is happening online, and so this gives us a a, a different way of presenting information. Uh, but one of the more positive implications is that. People are much more familiar with QR codes now, and so having a QR code on a product label, I think many more people will be familiar and comfortable actually scanning that and looking up additional information. Another big trend, I think, is this increasing concern for health, and that's not only just because a lot of people gained a few kilograms during the pandemic, and so obviously correlated with moving towards a more sustainable diet is uh, moving towards a more healthy diet. 
and and so we have apps and these wellness uh, products like uh, my fitness pal for example that a lot of people are increasingly using to track their food consumption but also this is an opportunity to present them with information about the sustainable choices they're making or, or not making and this is also being reflected in the options that are available to consumers so we see more and more plant-based options uh, available um, uh, a salient example for me here in sydney was the burger uh, restaurant called grilled and recently they converted a couple of their burger joints into purely plant-based burgers and and that was temporary but it made a, a big splash it was all over the news and that's not something that would have happened uh, a few years ago and I was reading some recent research. It was specifically focused on uh, the benefits of switching from a standard regular beef patty to one of these Impossible Burgers or Beyond Burgers. And that study found that uh, land use, water use, greenhouse gas emissions were all down by about 90% by making that switch. So it's a uh, it's a good move, even though it's uh, it's an unfamiliar one for for many consumers. And uh, the last one I'll touch on just. I think links back to something in Josh's report there about where people are getting information from. And I think a big trend is people getting information, not from friends, not from family experts, like, but actually from, from micro influencers. And this is definitely how a lot of particularly younger people are getting their information. So it would have been nice to look at the, the chart that Josh had put up split by generation because um, micro influencers tend to have the credibility, the trust factor that is so important but they also have the expertise factor. And because there are so many of them, uh, consumers can really pick and choose the micro influencer that they think speaks to them. So I think that's also an important source of information that we need to think about going forward. Thanks. Absolutely. Um, and Abhishek, obviously you're very familiar with uh, labeling and communicating. Um, do you want to say a few words about what you've seen in maybe some of the shifts in how we communicate or, or, or not? Yeah, thank, thank you, Victoria. No, I, I completely agree with what the rest of the panelists have shared. Uh, but I would also add that an additional aspect that we're seeing, and it's linking back to the QR codes or the labeling, is increasing consumer interest in things like traceability and knowing the origins and what's happening mm -hmm. in the supply chain, as well as consumer interest in the impact of what they're consuming. Um, in the context of India, of course, we're talking about the top socioeconomic strata here, which is buying like this, but you're seeing the role uh, of labeling coming through in that way, where it can communicate to the consumers about and needs to actually communicate. It, it's not just a passive uh, form of communication, but the fact that it could be picked up online or it could be picked up through other channels, but needs to communicate also about the social impact as well as the environmental impact of the food. So there is a growing trend moving in that direction. Great, so definitely some uh, familiar trends across the board here, even from all of your, your different lenses. Um, having a look at best practice, which we always like to refer, refer to so that we've got some practical examples. Um, can you share any successful examples or perhaps even tips for influencing consumer choices? And it might be just tapping into those trends that you've just talked about. Um, and obviously that is to help consumers make more sustainable food choices. Perhaps this time uh, we'll start with uh, Yuk Young. Uh, I think you made some some interesting insights. Have you got, have you seen any successful examples? Um, so unfortunately, um, so we, we, we haven't seen, I haven't seen in Korea any successful examples surrounding sustainability. So sustainability information is relatively new. Um, I would agree with the report that um, it, it's, a, we have to define what it means first. And we what we, what we see now in Korea is like um, something similar to sustainability would be equal labels um, that are in terms of um, organic anti um, non antibiotic or non pesticide some similar concepts that are in the um, equal labels that are provided by the government sponsored by the government, um, but but these are. Um, relatively um, confusing and 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 um, the the labels are used across not only foods but also like the detergents diapers and other products so whatever um, labeling regime that we would we would like to see as a, as a consumer organization is um, something simple consistent and frictionless for the consumers to understand which of course is um, 
mentioned in in the report. So. What we see is like, we see different government agencies diff running different labeling programs. Um, we have an environmental ag ag environmental agency having one set of um, um, labeling and we have a food and drug agency having another set of um, labeling. So it's just so confusing. So we, we would like to see something more simple, consistent and reliable on our side. Fair enough. I mean, as a consumer myself, I can identify with the lack of simplicity and sometimes you pick up a product and see a new thing that you didn't see before and, and you wonder is is that better than the last one is it good that it's got three stickers or is it better that it only has this one um perhaps uh, adrian you can comment a little bit on the uh again either examples um or perhaps tips to streamline and make it easy for people to make these sustainable food choices yeah so I've seen a lot of different examples of academic research studies showing, um, I guess, interventions that do nudge consumers' choices towards more sustainable options. Um, many of these haven't been trialed out in the field with um, you know, the, the, the general population, so that remains to be seen. But I'll just run through a number of different examples um, that may inspire, I, I guess, some others. So, firstly, uh, presenting information in a in a metric that is much more familiar. So I've actually done research where instead of presenting like CO2 equivalent, I translated that into light bulb minutes. So it was something like if you buy this meal, that's like 2000 minutes of a light bulb being on and showed that that metric, which is much more relatable, um, definitely caught the attention of the consumers in the study and influenced their choices. There's other research that has looked at um, traffic lights. Um, we see lots of research in what's called like nudging or, or choice architecture, which is this idea of just changing the way that options are presented a little bit in order to influence choices. So one way is to describe the social norm, what everyone is doing. Now, unfortunately, in, in this case, uh, sustainable um, purchase behavior is not the most common action. So we wouldn't describe the, you know, the fact that maybe only 10% of people are vegetarian, for example. What we can describe is the changing social norm. So we might say something like, in the last decade, the number of people who are vegetarian has doubled or, or whatever it is. So to show that there's been a shift and perhaps the, the person reading that sentence needs to change their behavior in order to basically catch that wave. And I'll finish with one more important um, element of choice architecture, and that is changing the default. So whenever there is a default possible, most people go with it for various reasons. And in certain situations, there is a default option. And I'm thinking in particular about meal delivery kits where there's some meals that are pre-selected for you. In my experience, they were always meat-based, but a, a very strong um, force is changing that and having maybe a more sustainable option as the default. So I'll stop there, thank you. Great, well, it's great to hear that there are some academic uh, options. Um, transitioning into, I guess, real, real world application, perhaps uh, Abhishek, your, your experience, um, I'm sure you've got many pockets of best practice uh, within fair trade itself and, and maybe in some of the examples where you're seeing people make sustainable food choices across the board. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, a lot of what the research has brought out uh, really kind of chimes with uh, how choice and sustainability is adopted. And I would say, first and foremost, sustainability uh, does not precede any of the primary decision-making choices, which may be value for money. I, I'm not saying price as much as value for money of the perceived value for money by the consumer, the quality and availability. So, you know, in terms of the consumer choice, and I think the study also brings that out, those are probably essential. So if you want to bring sustainable choices to the front, they must clear that hygiene factor of those uh, aspects of consumer choice. But in, in the fair trade ecosystem, I think one of, uh, the case studies that we have of bringing about sustainable choice to the consumers, but also seeing systematic change is uh, what we've seen in the adoption of sustainable cocoa. Now, there it was actually a multi-stakeholder uh, collaborative effort where there was obviously government participation, but industry took the lead um, and actually started talking about the and actually brought out uh, some of the champions brought out the issues around what is happening in the cocoa value chains. Uh, the likes of Tony's Chocolonies, for, for instance, from Europe, uh, brought out a lot more about slave labor and the effects it has on uh, the working conditions in West Africa, as well as deforestation in West Africa. So, you know, we, we had a, a multi-pronged approach. There were campaigns, 
the government also supported this locally and we then saw the local governments in west africa raising uh, you know this minimum support price for cocoa uh, which was significantly higher than what the market price was at that point leading to that systematic change leading to more big business also committing then to buying on those better prices and bringing that choice to the consumer which was more sustainable so i think it was you know uh, uh, something like what tom said that business has a role and, and consumers depend on that choice to be brought forward by business but also if you educate the consumers and bring out the issues consumers will then choose that better option so that's one aspect and the other aspect that we've seen uh, whether it's in tea with brands like makai bari in india or ben and jerry's ice cream in the us is when sustainability is not an add on but an integral part of the business and the brand um and so you know when when the brand brings in sustainability as a core value or a core uh, brand identity um then i think we've seen that that uh, tends to draw consumers in in a way that uh, connects with the other aspects of the value proposition as well Fantastic. I think that's two brilliant examples. I mean, the, the cocoa industry as a whole, I think the multi-stakeholder approach is very important. And now you see, you can go into any um, small store and get, and, and you can see the, the big companies that have, have, have participated in, in making sustainable cocoa part of their, their offering. Um, and then I also think with the uh, brands that you talked about making it a core part of their identity uh, i mean that speaks volumes to me I, I spend my days creating sustainability strategies and working with companies on uh, actually making sustainability part of the business dna um so it's great to hear some of those examples and i think for anybody that's listening the case studies that josh referenced that are part of this report we created 12 case studies um that are those real life examples so if you if you go to have a look at those um you'll see examples of some of those types of companies in different parts of the world um tom just switching to you to answer this one because i think you seafood is another example of an industry that has actually i think from my perspective had some success um do you want to, to say a couple of words on on your experience? Yeah, definitely. I, I think in this space, um, when I look back over the past couple of years, definitely, uh, you know, a greater share of our marketing investment is going now going into talking to sustainability messages, which is great. And I think, you know, as we do that more and more, we've definitely been learning along the way around what works and what doesn't. And um, I've summarized four things, which I think kind of been key learnings for us internally as, as a business. And I thought I'd share those today. So the first, and this has already been mentioned, is around simplicity. Um, you know, recent did, uh, recently did a um, research study where, you know, 50% of people say that brands and financial claims are confusing. Um, there's so many, there's so many different ways of talking to it. There's not a lot, um, a lot of consistency across how different brands speak to it. So this whole kind of level of confusion and misunderstanding is really prevalent. Um, and while we know that sustainability is a complex issue with a lot of different dimensions to it, the messaging doesn't have to be. So I think really recommending that we keep their messaging simple, um, clear and easy to comprehend is really important. Mm -hmm. Um, the second is around credibility, and I think this is obviously where things like eco labels come into it. You know, consumers can be distrusting of big brands, so building trust is really important. And I think, you know, you know, for some of our brands like John West, this has been where you know the strong partnerships we have with thought leaders, you know, like WWF, like MSC, like Pacifical, um, have really helped build the brand's credibility. Um, you know, in our sustainability credentials and you know the initiatives that we support. Um, the third is around, I think when we've communicated, it's always been most effective when it's been a combination of both the rational and emotional, you know, it does have to have scientific backing, you know, that's mm -hmm. part of that credibility piece, but you've got to bring it to life and, and, you know, talk to it in a way that really tugs on those heartstrings and connects emotionally with consumers and shoppers. Um, and then finally, this is kind of a, probably a bit of more recent learning in that we've been doing some research groups around um, one of our brands um, packaging and really focusing on how do we talk to sustainability in a more impactful way. Um, and probably the, the, the big kind of, um, you know, the one common thing that came out across all these different, you know, groups, you know, compromising of you know different types of shoppers was really just the lack of commonality i don't think there's a one size fits 
broad approach here. You know, people come from different levels of understanding about sustainability, different levels of, I guess, um, you know, interest in the topic. And I think we can't try and find one solution which is going to meet the needs of everyone. But how do you have um, different layers of messaging which talk to, you know, the, the broad kind of consensus in different ways that kind of meets the individual needs? Fantastic. Um, very concrete examples there. So I think uh, hopefully we'll be able to take some of those on board. Right, we've got um, about four minutes left. So with our last question, I will ask you to keep to one minute. Um, so just uh, one idea, if you have one, um, around opportunities. So obviously we've talked about the, the complexity involved, but there's definitely an opportunity. Um, what do you think are some of the most promising opportunities or what are you excited about where you might be able to influence consumers going forward to make more sustainable food choices? And let's kick off with Adrian this time. Uh, building off, I think the last comment from Tom, I think the, uh, the biggest opportunity is personalizing information and personalizing the choice architecture by the fact that we have many decisions that are now happening in apps, we can figure out where the individual sits kind of on their uh, their journey, what stage they're in, if they're goal intention or behavior intention or implement implementation stage. And uh, there's research already that exists showing that if you can tailor the information to where that individual is across these series of decisions, um, you can affect their behavior more strongly. Great, so essentially big data and personalization is where there's a big opportunity. Yog Jung? Yeah, so I was actually thinking of the same thing. So I would like to see that type of a nudging te technique that's used offline mm -hmm. um, replicated in, uh, in the e-commerce um, section too. So like, for example, algorithms that are programmed to promote and list show more sustainable options more prominently, list them um, first and such. So I would like to see that in the future. Fantastic. And uh, Tom, let's go to you. Um, Abhishek mentioned this earlier, but um, for me, it's transparency. I, I think consumers are demanding more information about the products they buy. We're always challenged in canned seafood. You know, a 95 gram can of tuna is a very small space to try and communicate a lot of information. And I think this is <laughs> where um, the ability of tech um, can really help support this. You know, as mentioned earlier, I think by Adrian around the use of um, QR codes and how they can kind of bring information to life, you know, um, you know, through your mobile phone. Um, and I think there's some really great players um, in this space who are really, you know, leading the charge. You know, one of our um, partners, Pacifico, is doing some really exciting things on the back end. And I think the challenge is how do we bring that to life for consumers? Fantastic. And Abhishek, I hope uh, Tom didn't steal your big idea. What, um, what would you, you say is uh, the... <laughs> well, go but... on. I'll, I'll let you say it anyway. You know, no, just to build on what Tom said, I mean, traceability and transparency, definitely. But I think yeah. uh, also building on something else that Tom talked about, building an emotional connect with with the supply chain and what is happening behind. And we're seeing, again, technology coming in to allow that. Uh, yes, you can get some hard facts about the carbon footprint, water footprint, and so on. But also bringing in that narrative and story of the impact from the personal perspective behind the supply chain. So we're seeing a lot of interest and traction in that side as well. And I think... Uh, yeah, that's an exciting opportunity. Fantastic. So it's great to hear that as well as challenge, there is opportunity. There's definitely a trend in this direction. I think if uh, I'll take the liberty to summarize, I think we're looking at personalization, uh, nudging techniques, transparency, traceability, um, and emotional connection. So not only throwing facts at people, but actually giving them the opportunity to connect with it and then using those techniques and technology to be able to help them make better, more sustainable decisions. Um, with that, we're at the top of the hour. I thank everybody on the uh, on the panel. This has been very interesting. Um, very excited to see what happens next. Thank you indeed to Josh Bishop for presenting the findings of the study. Like I said, I think it's very interesting to see what's going on behind, behind the scenes and, and how people are making sustainable food choices. And let's hope that forums like this and uh, the work that we're all doing in all of our respective um places will make a will make will make a difference so i will let those of you who are in zones where it's lunchtime to go and make a sustainable healthy choice for lunch and for those of you who uh, are a bit later on in the day maybe it's time for a uh, sustainably sourced coffee and with that we will wrap up the webinar
Thank you very much.